testing, testing.
missing something? No, I am. Huh. But it. Ladies and gentlemen, will you take your chairs, please? First of all, I would like to welcome you this evening and thank you for giving some time this evening to an issue which we think is vital to the future of the Yukon. My name's uh, Stu Clark, and I'm on the board of the uh, Yukon Conservation Society. And uh, about eight months ago, I'm a, a retired engineer, and myself and Jack Cable, who's back here, and John Mason, who's somewhere I haven't seen yet, the, the three of us were talking about energy in the Yukon. And our particular interest was how would it be possible to get more wind and solar power being used here? And it was more than just the fact that we think it's nice to have some windmills on hills or solar panels on houses. It's the fact that in the Yukon, we, are, we rely for over 97% of our power from hydroelectric. And of course, all of us think that the rivers will always run. But if you know anything about other parts of the world where they've had droughts and where climate change is causing river flows to drop, we know that putting all your eggs in that one basket is not a great idea. And furthermore, diesel, which is the source for all of the communities, requires buying diesel whose price is going up all of the time. So we're faced with higher, higher costs for diesel and questionable reliability from hydroelectric. Of course, hydroelectric will always have a place here, but we need to diversify the energy mix. So the three of us said, what is it going to take to get past the argument that it doesn't blow all the time and the wind doesn't shine at, or the sun doesn't shine at night. And the obvious answer to that was storage. And furthermore, that storage is not something that just happens in uh, university laboratories. It's being practiced and used all over the world. And we said, we need to know a lot of a lot more about how storage could be used here. So we made phone calls across Canada to try to find out who could we get to come to the Yukon and explain to us what is the current state of off-the-shelf practical energy storage. And after making a number of inquiries, we were told the man that we want is Ravi Siddhapati. And Ravi is the person who's going to be speaking to you this evening. Ravi spent 32 years working for Ontario Hydro. And during those 32 years, the last 12 years was in research and development, which gave him a unique perch from which to see how energy technology is evolving around the world. Retired now, Ravi travels regularly to India and the Gulf various other countries advising them on how to make their energy systems better. We hoped that Ravi would be the person to help us out here to make it understandable how we can have practical energy storage in the Yukon. We think we've found the key to the lock, the lock that will unlock the future of energy in the Yukon. So will you join me in welcoming Ravi Siddhapati.
get to that, actually. <laughs> you know what? If you turn this on, that's fine for this, I think, uh, while you change the battery. So. Oh, I'm working now? Yeah. Okay, good. Can you hear the back? Yeah, okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you for the small glitch in the energy storage. It's one technology, and I thought we should talk about all the forms of energy storage because at the end of the day, each application has got a unique space. A lot of development has taken place. Billions and billions of dollars of energy storage are being deployed all over the world. And we need to understand where they are coming and what space will they occupy in the solution that you have in your product. Let me sort of put four big sort of slay the dragon kind of pictures, right? One is you have, as Stu mentioned, uh, a reliance on diesel for the winter peaks. Uh, I, there was, uh, I mentioned that in the 15 years ago, it was at minus 27, probably in January, sort of, when the peakers came on, the fossil peakers, so to speak. Now it's at minus five, and it's around December. So that is one trend. So it's, it's there, right? Whether whatever you attribute it to, it's a trend. The second trend you have is the notion that it was $45 a barrel last year, it's $68 bar dollars a barrel yesterday, likely to go to 85, so 100% rise in fossil fuel. So you're gonna pay for it, right? So that's the second trend. The third is your building codes are so good and your houses are so well done that HVAC systems are almost redundant. That $18,000 with ductwork and furnaces and everything can be done with now baseboard heating. So as the residences grow, as your community grows, guess what, the electric heat aspect is gonna grow. So you've got three trends that you have to talk about that says where will you can't be, but there is a bigger one, and I think it's very much more difficult to predict is, with every mine comes around 10 megawatts, 15 megawatts of energy growth. And they have their standbys, they have the, their secure systems that they need in case the grid gives a little bit of trouble, and guess what do they use? They use these. So if you are to project these four problems, if you will, or a trend line, whatever you like to call it, you have an issue economic, ecological, and at the end of the day, a shortfall. So why not solve part of that economically? Why not solve part of that through the technology mix and understand what other pieces can be at play in a, in a, in a place that you are filled with good natural resources? Right, namely wind, solar, pumped hydro, the, the mechanics of uh, using pumped hydro, uh, biomass. So the equation suddenly changes to say, if I need technology mix for security, I need reliable power. If I have a Quebec-like situation or an Ontario-like situation at minus 35, in Toronto we were down with three climate change initiatives in the city of Toronto. We were down for eight days. Talk of reliability, talk of resilience, you give any good name from electrical theory, we were against it. We had football fields of water in one summer that drowned one of our biggest substations. Two kilometers away was another substation that did not have a drop of water. Where would you have a rainfall that's just two kilometers, you know, dramatic difference? So whether we call climate change a science, whether we accept 1.5 degree, two degrees, as when I go to Japan, I have this big argument, uh, but you know, engineer versus science, so to speak. But nevertheless, when you tour things around, you see visibly climate change with you, including this museum in this place here. You look at the glaciers, you see the Bering Sea, where it was and where it is today. That should sort of say, you know what? It can happen anytime. So the, there is no linearity to some of these things. It happens, and so the question is, as human beings, we have to sort of look and say, what is our best solution going forward? So I'm here to sort of say, okay, if we have a lot of intermittent power, where are the technology is going to take place and what can be used? What methods have been used, adopted by others? Where have price points fallen? Dramatic changes have come in energy storage in the last 12 years. When I began my career in 2004 in, as a head of R&D, then head of Smart Grid, I had, was very fortunate to bring in renewables into Ontario, which came from policy. So those of you probably who heard me this morning on CBC, uh, it's my view that the best jurisdictions around the world, it's not just any one province in this country, has actually begun with policy because that's the collective wisdom of people. Your debates, your arguments, your form, your storm, your form, 
in the end, you move society. The dial moves, and the dial hopefully moves in the right direction. And so that's a kind of a, a request, if you will. In all my meetings, the last two days, that's two arranged me, kept me very busy. And, but I think it's a great, great discussion to have, and this is the finale. Finale with you being there, you know? And so I think it's very good. So I think what we need to do is to say, okay, what are the forms that are here? And in the end, I'm open to questions on anything related to this. It doesn't have to be energy storage. Whatever little I know, I'll share. Whatever I don't know, I'll learn from you. Okay, so trust me, we're all the same here. So what are the essentials of energy storage? And I'm gonna breeze through that carefully. It's the simplest form of energy storage is a tank with two taps. And the tank is actually the energy. So the bigger the tank, the more the energy. And the diameter of the two taps is what we call the power. Power to charge the tank and the power to discharge the tank. So when you look at any form of energy storage, ask yourself this question because it never gets asked. People make an assumption it's battery and it'll do certain wonders. It generally doesn't do wonders. If you specify wrong, you're, you're out in your ROI. And if you specify right, you know you get the right technology. So keep that. that, that is the simplest form of it. The second issue is, depending on the diameter of the taps, the pressure of the water, I can fill the tank very quickly, I can fill the tank very slowly. All that is a mechanism. So you pay for more the requirements, the more the rigorous requirements you begin to now pay, and you move up the investment ladder. So more easier you make it on yourself as a part of systems design, the cost of energy storage actually is not very high. It's what you make out to be. Okay, and so I thought let me sort of throw that in. What are the forms of energy storage? I've had the privilege of working with all these. As an R&D manager, some of them were in our demo projects. With BC Hydro, us, Hydro Quebec, we did many things together. And also with the US utilities, uh, and we had to go through the regulator on all these cases. So except for cryogenics, which is sitting in the UK, and who knows, maybe that is your answer. I'm not saying it is. Uh, all the other technologies have actually been deployed in Ontario, Quebec, and other parts, okay, and, and now in the world. So we'll talk about each one, its, its uniqueness, uh, where does it fit, you know, where does it not fit, and you will get an idea as to each one is not just a simple battery system. So, if I can, yeah. This is a very, ch a ch just a chart that shows on the bottom, in the power side, the kilowatt size, going all the way up to megawatts and gigawatts, and then the time is seconds, minutes, hours. Don't get drawn up too much, I'm gonna move the slide quickly. All it tells you is, you need to also pick where you wanna be on this graph, and a technology will drop out, or a set of technology will drop out. So if you get that wrong in your problem set, you got the wrong technology that you're gonna live with for the next 20 years. So let's look at the technologies. This is a circle that I drew for Japan. I go to the Clean Energy Forum in Japan. As an engineer, I have sort of questions on the science side, and I'm saying, move the needle now, it's time to practice. We've had enough of science. The two degree, 1.5 degree, for those of you who are you know, in that area. Uh, in the end, how does it affect humanity? And it's in the end, the engineering implications of is what solves the human problem. Uh, we can talk about the science and the literature and all that kind of thing. So in the circle, generally most of us are always thinking of batteries, batteries, batteries. It's a chemical form of storage, and I'll get to see how the batteries themselves are very different in technology. But there are different forms. So within the battery side, you know, you've got the capacitor hybrid batteries, you've got the lithium batteries, you've got the fuel cells, and then you've got the flow battery. Each one is different. But we still coin it as a battery, as though, you know, it's a, a, a power tool that does our job, or a, a battery that just failed in my lipol mic just now. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's still called the lithium, if you will, right? And we'll get to talk about that. But what we generally don't talk about, I think, is all the other commercial, and all these are commercialized technologies. They're not sitting in R&D in somebody's laboratory. Is the mechanical, the bioenergy, and the thermal energy, which has a place in what we want to do, depending on what we want to do. So the flywheel system, you know, you have an underwater storage in Lake Ontario. If you come to Toronto, you'll see there's a system. What it does is takes compressed air, puts it in balloons underwater under hydrostatic pressure, and then, of course, you take the reverse out and, and, and you generate power. You have underground, uh, in fact, the same technology in Godrich where you've taken a mine, 
we use a large capacity storage, uh, low energy, low power, but high energy, lots of energy stored in a cavern. And it's just compressed air, so no CO2 and all that kind of stuff that gets done in other parts of the country. Flywheels has actually come up dramatically in the last two, in the last eight years. It used to be 15 years ago or eight years ago, the first flywheel that was put in the PGA market, the Belkin wheel, was not in vacuum. It used to quickly slow down. Uh, but today, you will not believe that these units are in vacuum. They are held by magnetic suspensions, and they spin at 10,000 RPM plus plus plus. And if you let the power go, they can actually coast for hours before they'll come to standstill which is not the case if you see within the regular flywheel in air that we are so used to sitting on, a, uh, on in the old days. So a lot of things have come around there. Also, power electronics has made things unimaginable, right? Today, I can take a flywheel that's slowing down. In the old days, if it slowed down, the frequency would also come off, and that means we don't get stable frequency for our systems. Our electrical gadgets all work on a single frequency. But now the power electronics says, I don't care what your RPM is. I'll do magic on my wave, and I'll actually give you 60 hertz. So now I can take the same flywheel that used to be 15 minutes. I can now move it to four hours. Yes, I've got to drop the power level. But as it coasts down previously, 80% of the flywheel speed was unusable. Today, about 70% of the flywheel speed is usable. So that's, again, thanks to power tracks. The bottom right-hand side is bioenergy. It rarely gets talked about. It's, I think, a very vital piece in the equation of technology mix. And not everybody is fortunate to have a biomass as Canada is. Okay, it's, it's, it's there for us to use. So we have, what have we done in that area is in Ontario, as you know, the ring of fire, the northern mine development was a big one. And we don't have transmission. In fact, it's named after JP here, the Pinard TS. So if you come west of Porcupine Pinard going to Thunder Bay, Kenora, White Shell, uh, it, it doesn't have enough of transmission. So either we can build transmission or we big, bring alternative supply lines. And so the biomass line was also to be thought of as a potential to augment the transmission line instead of just spending it all on transmission. So we worked hard and hard and hard, and that was at Ontario Power Generation when, it, when we broke up Ontario Hydro. And we could not fire the biomass in the coal-fired station. So Atticoken and others were all destined for transfer to biomass. The pellets were so poor in the storage because they were, had to be stored outside like a coal pile when you have a 60, 70 megawatt station. It's not a small you know, shed, you have to store it outside. And with humidity, they picked up humidity and became mush. So the pellet was useless to fire into the boiler. Even though the boiler was a tangential fired boiler, some of the best boilers you can find in the market, right? So they, that was it. But now, two years ago, that problem has been solved. So today's Atticoken runs on 100% biomass. Why? Because the pellets have been made in such a way that there is a kind of a impregnated coating that water doesn't go and destroy it. And therefore, it can be stored. And therefore, biomass today is viable, provided you want to adopt it as one of your strategies. If you come to the smaller side, you know, you don't need to actually pelletize it necessarily. It depends on the type of boiler, because the big commercial power system boilers you fire them in a vortex. And so you need the pellets like coal, you know, like the crushed coal, you need to fire them, and it creates a vortex called a tangentially fired boiler. But as you come down to the industrial boiler, wood chips are actually not that bad. You can have bigger pieces. You may have issues of calorific value. You may have issues of storing them indoors in dry climates. But it's still usable as you come down the scale into a smaller and smaller boiler. So don't get me wrong that everything's got to be pelletized. It doesn't have to. And then you come to the very last, is at the last mile, right? Uh, and this is a little unique, I'm not gonna go there, uh, is all the technologies that we generally don't think of is in that segment. The first is cryogenics. Liquid air, when I take air and I liquefy it, and I, it becomes liquid, like your LNG is one, uh, I actually have an air that's much denser because it's at minus 60, 164 Kelvin. And therefore, your density of storage or energy capture is dramatically high. It's much higher than just compressed air because compressed air you can only compress so much. And, and so now for large energies, it becomes a viable solution. Now you may say, you know what, do we actually know how to liquefy air? And I can tell you, we already use liquefied air as oxygen 
and nitrogen in our hospitals. You go down to the hospital, you'll see these vertical columns, air liquid, I don't know if it's still around here. They are the suppliers. There are two or three very well-known suppliers. The, the columns actually can store that cool for months and months and months. It's not that you need to use them in two days. And so that technology, the, the, the whole liquefier, all that has been around for 80 years. You don't have a problem. The question is, as I expand it from minus 164 to even minus 35, which is your winters, I still get a huge expansion as air expands from minus 164 to minus 35. Now, if I add heat, I take it even higher. Let's say at 200 degrees, I can now say minus 164 all the way up to plus 200 actually drives steam turbines, a power generation uh, unit. Where have I got done this? I was very fortunate to be introduced to Gareth Brett, to Donna Summers in the UK. And outside of Heathrow Airport, if you get a chance to take a day off, go see Slough. That was the first unit that we demoed there. It was 150 kilowatts in a small site, probably as half of this auditorium, with, with tall columns. And it stored something like 400 megawatt hours. It's a long storage, big storage. Now again, remember my two taps in the tank? Depending on the size of the tank is what you pay for. And so if you keep saying, you know, I'm going to dribble energy in and I'll store it for a long period of time to be shifted, what do I have? I have a see-through shift. So I don't have to use necessarily certain technologies that are coupled with uh, power. I leave the liquids and the phase change material, the PCMs are phase change material. They are typically used at the very last mile inside a house, inside offices. What it does is, it's like the latent heat of water. For those of you who are a little science oriented, 80 calories per gram is what water absorbs or gives it off at the zero degree without changing temperature. So phase change materials are here made from food additives that actually can make changes at 23 degrees, 24 degrees, 28 degrees, 29 degrees as you, you make it. So in very many places around the world, it could not, may not be here, we put them actually in false partitions so that they actually help in lowering the air conditioning bills. Because at, as the temperature goes up to 29, what you have is the phase change material kicks in. It then either solidifies or liquefies depending on heat or cool. And then what you have is the, the air compressor doesn't have to pump as much as hard, right? So it is, it's a one technology. So let me move on and then quickly say, okay, what does each one say? By far the largest energy storage in the world, if I was to draw a bubble diagram, it's like the sun and the earth. Pumped hydro storage is the largest today, even after all the other investments have been made. The question is, you have to find the geology, you have to find the right investments, and many countries are not endowed with this. You are, you are. So you gotta think about it, right? Saudi Arabia cannot do this, right? Saskatchewan probably cannot do this, but you can. So think about it, I'm not saying it is the answer. And what this does, is it basically uses the turbine for generating at night when the prices are low or surplus, the, the turbine becomes a pump and it pumps right back up. Now where do we have this in Canada? We have two being actually done right now in Ontario. Private sector company, Algonquin Power, listed on the Toronto Stock Exchange, Sam Mantenuto, my former, not boss, but equally boss. He runs the company. He gets money from the Toronto Stock Exchange. They actually own power plants around the world, much like ATCO does. Brookfield does, big company. So all you have to do is to engage a conversation with that company, and who knows, maybe you already have two or three sites around that can use pump storage. And it is not that you have to pay CapEx and put it in the tax base and all that. In the end, what you will get is an equivalent tariff as a result of all the investments that he makes, and he capitalizes that over 25, 30, 40, 50, 60 years, and there will be a tariff, and that tariff is what will come based on what the geology looks like, what is the size, and so on. So, so it's doable. So the two drawings that I've got are actually off. One is an open mine that's being used, and the other one is a geological formation where there's a head pond and the head pond down to the river. So the two of them are being used. The second is the chemical, which is the most prevalent. Everybody talks of batteries and chemistry. So I thought let me put up a slide and look at all the three forms. The first top left is a typical cell, like a lead acid battery, you got an anode, a cathode, and an electrolyte, right? And then uh, below that, I've got this U-shaped thing, and that is the NAS battery, the sodium sulfur battery, came out of Japan, NGK, 
BC has got one, NYSERDA in New York has got one. But if you go to Japan, they are actually in public places all over the streets, in schools, just outside schools, in parking lots, and every place like that. So the NAS battery within the context of public realm has been accepted as a distributed energy storage. And so it's been used. And then you come just to the right of it is a vanadium redox. Has not had a success, unfortunately. Three Canadian companies went under. Every time we, it rises up like a mole, something goes on, and then bam, you know, it goes down. So, so it's unfortunate. The Chinese own all this now. The VRB of Vancouver, uh, Tim Hennessy went down. I mean, he and I know, go back 20 years. Went down to the south, created Emergy out of San Francisco. That went down. Sun Edison tried this. That's gone. So the question is, it has not had its luck. But who knows? The fourth time may be better. But this technology allows you to completely decouple, like compressed air, the power versus energy. Because the energy is the size of the two tanks. The bigger the tanks, the more the energy it holds. And, and the pump is actually your power. So I can, I can have low drift power coming in to create long-term energy storage. And all you need is like water tanks. And the two water tanks are the two chemicals. They're not very concentrated like acid or anything like that. It's 0 .01, 0 0.05 normal. For those of you chemists out here, it's 0 0.05 normal. Right? And so that's one. Now, where are these? These are actually deployed some in Ontario and some in North America. So these are all the companies, and I'm putting them Visine and Cellcube. And the bottom two left, one I had a hand in the very one to the left, and that was the first containerized lithium battery in Ontario. We wanted to actually show that it is within the community realm. So we put it in as a, as a container. And where do you think we put it? We put it right downtown Toronto to tell and ask and seek all the powers, be it within the provincial government, the mayor, the police chief, the fire chief, how would we, you know, each one do their own part, putting out a fire if it comes, is it noise, look at the noise, there's hardly any noise. Previous people thought it was like a diesel generator, it'll make a lot of noise, it's actually, it makes actually no noise. So, it, it, it's today we have lots of containerized battery, in fact, in the US and other parts of the world. It's, it's, it's become almost like a fabrication plant, right, it's there. What it starts off with is a cell, which if you can see the top right hand corner, it's a cell, many cells make up a module, many modules make up a stack, and many stacks actually make the battery. So it's very scalable relative to what we think, and that's why they can cook one up for you depending on what your specs are, and, and that's how it works. So on the power side, I thought, let me talk about the chemical batteries first, and they're all DC, and then you have to invert them to AC. So you need an extra inverter to actually bring them to AC because our life is in the AC world yet. I sit on the LVDC committee of the IEC, International Committee. Somewhere along the lines will become a DC world, but right now it's still the AC world. Okay. So, but, you know, a lithium is not a lithium is not a lithium. This is the biggest myth we have. Oh, you know, I've got lithium back. Actually, depending on what you want, there are several variants of lithium within a lithium battery. There's a lithium ferrous, there's a lithium, lithium phosphate, there's a lithium phosphate oxide, there's a lithium manganese, there's a lithium manganese cobalt, there's a lithium cobalt, you name it, there's all variants of chemistry attached to the lithium anode that gives it different characteristics. And so there are manufacturers in North America. You know, there's at least four in Canada. There are probably several down south of the border. And SAFT battery, NEC of Japan, LG of Korea, they all, they are the dominant players of the world. The dominant players of the world are no longer North America. Let me tell you that. It's like 10 to 1. BYD is one of the biggest phosphate battery manufacturers in the world. And if you look at their plants, actually the Tesla plant is nothing. Nothing. So be you know, aware of that. But, sorry? Yeah, and that's how we, they began, right? So vehicles, right? I agree. Uh, but their main business is selling batteries, right? But if you come down to the specs part of it, it leads you into wrong decision making if you're not careful. And this was a discussion we had with several of the electric companies and the technology people in the last two days. If I come down from long time to the right of the chart, which is 360, that's three hours, let's say, or 360 minutes, it looks like, you know, the silver line is the lowest cost, because why? That's below all of the, all of the line, the blue line, the red line, black line, green line, right? But as I come down closer and closer, 
and I ask for requirements in the 15 minute, 30 minute, 45 minute range, you suddenly find the silver is not the cheapest. It's actually the most expensive. The red line, which is the most expensive for long ranges, has now suddenly become the cheapest. So we need to be very careful as to what you specify, because what you specify actually means what gets tailored. And then once you are stuck with it, that suit is yours. You can't change that once it's, 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 it's done, right? Then you look at the top of the curve, right? And the flywheels, and so it's basically three graphs. You have actually the flywheel, which is, I believe, in blue. And then you have the red, which is the lithium ion. And then you have the flow battery, which is in black. Again, depending on the time and the number of cycles, whether you want one cycle per day, two cycles per day, three cycles per day, look how the valuations change. So overall growth of the flywheel story, the fact that lithium ion is now being competing against other forms of energy storage is the message I want to convey. I'm not saying which is right, which is wrong. It's, it's a message. So it's no longer just a battery, battery, battery. Look at the flywheel, how much of technology has gone in and amount dramatic thing. The one to the right is temporal power. When I was the R&D manager, the first temporal power was done through Ryerson with Emerson controls. It was actually an electrician who had this idea in his garage came to us, Jeff Veltry, came to us and said, I believe you know, there is a value to this, and I can tell you it works. And so that's where the temporal power, and what he did was, it's a cylinder with a rotating mass that's in vacuum, spinning levitated in, in permanent magnet to reduce the, the, the actual drag on it. It's levitated in with, uh, with uh, a permanent magnet, spinning at 10,000 RPM, 100,000 pounds, single drop for steel for all you steel mechanical guys, and it's rotating at 10,000 RPM. Shakes the hell out of you, isn't it? It's standing next to it. So unitize, it's a 500 kilowatt drum. It's, it's about that high and, and probably about four feet. But because it was a mass of steel, it had to be buried in the ground for protection. You don't want to stand next to it when it lets go, right? And so now you had a problem. So now what happened, so when we put the first five megawatt station at Hydro One, which was 10 of these spinning wheels. It was the, the lowest cost actually was, because of civil construction, a five megawatt plant. It was not anything lower than that was astronomically high. But it solved our solar problem. Because it was not the battery that actually solved solar unless you design it differently. Hawaii hammered all its battery. It, it went in two years. And we have had cases after cases where wrong specification of batteries, thinking that batteries is, will solve all my problem, actually has, is not correct. You have to design the battery right, or you have to go for other technology. So today, 2.0, high wide 2.5, uh, 2.0, it has got all the right techniques. They've, they've actually solved the problem, right? And so you, if you actually Google, you'll see a lot of the horror stories of batteries being sort of misapplied as of being applied, right? But coming back to the flywheel, so that was the first version. So relative to the PGM version of Belton, which was 1970s maybe, it was a Canadian who came up with this version, okay? And today they have divested it. It's now a company and it's doing whatever it's doing. So we help them in the R&D side. We don't take ownership in anything as a public utility, but a lot of companies were formed as a result of the good work of the R&D guys. But one problem existed. What was the problem was cost. So now we have a whole bunch of guys saying, you know, how do I reduce the cost? So the first thing is you bring it from underground to above ground. Just think of it, right? That's slay the dragon, remember the five things I said? You have to have, that's the slay the dragon here is, if I want to reduce cost by an order of magnitude, I have to bring it to ground level. So the rest of the technologies that you see, guess what, it's all above ground. So people have made, you know, sort of in the thing, the one that you see the open container, the orange in, in the middle, is 60 kilowatt flywheels all within a 10 foot container. So you can go down to 60 kilowatts for a community, for a small home if you wish, or a set of homes in a community. Think of all the other remote communities you have. You can actually apply this, and I'll tell you where it comes useful, okay? Or you can actually go with the Amber guys of San Francisco who have got this, remember the power conversion I said? It doesn't matter what the speed is, but it gives you 60 hertz. That's those guys. And then the one in the middle is the Germans who, instead of saying, doing steel and getting, you know, sort of saying, is it safe, not safe, they built it actually out of carbon fiber. But because the half mv squared, for those of you who are physics, half mv squared is the inertia that it takes, 
they actually said, okay, because the mass is lower, I'm going to compensate on the velocity. So they spin it at 30,000 RPM. Now, you may say, oh, my God, you know, 30,000 RPM, you know, these guys are dreaming, maybe I'll get killed. But if you look at race cars, that flywheel that sits in a race car is within two and a half feet of the driver. Has existed for what, 40 years? So these technology has come from people thinking about using existing practices. The liquid air I talked about, this one. It's not that they created the new drug, right? It's not a drug discovery thing here. It's being smart to use technology that other people use, and they just put it together to form a new component. In there, they chose the reliability of each one of them since that it matched, right? And so the flywheel technology today, in my view, is very appropriately being used elsewhere, including inertia. So if you take the diesel off in a remote community, you may have heard the term inertia. This is a power systems term. You need r rotating iron to maintain frequency when certain disturbances happen. You can't have all solar and wind and others, including battery systems, because they offer no inertia. The inertia is what keeps it going when certain disturbances occur. So this is your true sort of uh, inertia because it's a rotating mass. So in many communities, and you'll see that happening in across the border in Alaska, where the ABB folks have done it, in Australia, in other parts of the world, this becomes an essential component of you spin the wheel up, back off the diesel, and it just gets enough of you know what's called the drag power. And it's your anchor, boat anchor. And if anything goes wrong up and down on the thing, it's, it's the flywheel that takes it. So now you can put solar, and all the variants of solar gets absorbed by the flywheel. It doesn't enter your house, and therefore you see a very stable supply. And if, for heaven forbid, something happens, and these flywheels have got to come off, and they, and they drop to the standstill, then you use the diesel to fire that back up. Take some time, of course. Now remember the two valves and the drum? The, you know, these flywheels can't just be started up in 10 minutes. They probably would take more like 45 minutes to an hour, depending on the power that you give it. But typically, it's a quarter hour. So if you take the next one, it's the cryogenics, my favorite, OK? Garrett's breath, Donna Summers. Remember, Heathrow Airport. That's where it is. So these guys have actually picked every part of this, and that's the cryogenics container. Everything is available in the market. They just put it together. Their IP is the process, the thermodynamic process, when you release, how much it is, and what should be the type of the valve, what should be the diameter, how much of heat to be injected. And it's actually a steam turbine. So it's no longer something that's fanciful. And so now it's a five megawatt station in the UK. And GE has purchased the rights to it to be used with its gas turbine fleet all over the world. And remember, gas, the, GE's biggest seller is actually the gas turbine around the world, largely in the Middle East, Far East, Malaysia, other places, right? So they have used this. Uh, so they have thought it to purchase it as an options contract, like your stock market. I don't know how many of you guys play stock market, but you have debt, you have equity, and then you have the options. So this is like an options contract for the GE guys to purchase this option to be used exclusively for them for the gas turbine market, okay? Now, if I don't add heat, and you may say, you know, can we do it adiabatically? You can, but it's such, so difficult to capture that heat of compression, because when you compress heat, it, it actually heats up. And then you have to store that heat to be fed back when you expand, right? That, to me, I think, is where you're now making science your future. And you're trying to live off that science, very difficult for adiabatic. So the best is, if you've got waste heat, or if you can actually produce heat, then is to just use that 250 degree, 300 degree heat and say it's a part of my expense. As long as I know it's not coming from fossil, it could come from biomass, it could come from anything else. Now I've got a full commercial, you know, sort of utility grade or a community grade. I can decide what I want. Okay, so, so we need to just think of these pieces separately. Compressed air is another Ontario story, okay? So we had a person who came out of the professor at the University of Windsor when I was there. And he said, you know, why not just use compressed air? Why? Because compressed air is the cheapest. You compress air, you store it, and then you use the hydrostatic pressure or the pressure of compression to pump it back out. But it has got its challenges. It's not something simple. Initially, people said, you know, I can store it in salt caverns. I can do all that, much like the Saskatchewan boundary dam where CO2 is stored. I don't know how many of you are from Saskatchewan. Saskatchewan, the only place in the world that stores CO2 underground is actually the boundary dam. 
It's called the Boundary Dam, but it's actually a thermal power plant right on the border of uh, it, uh, Manitoba. And so compressed air has been around where the mine, and an underground mine is unused, you know, can we use it? Now, if air does escape, big deal. It ain't going to cause algae blooms. It ain't going to cause any other problem. Yes, you have a loss. So you have to do the geological formation. So salt caverns are used. But there's one problem. You have to go where the cavern is. The cavern doesn't come to you. And so if you're not fortunate enough to have those caverns, or if you have open pit mining like you have in Yukon, you can do only certain things that you, uh, you can't compress it and keep it. So this gentleman came up and said, you know, with the uh, professor and said, why not I just put it underwater? And therefore, there's enough of water bodies around that can actually store these balloons. These balloons are anchored to the bottom of the lake or could be the sea. And you know, that allows me now to open up a whole bunch of architecture of an energy storage that's distributed and I can size it differently and I can use it for whatever purpose I need. So that's how the first one, so that's a picture of Lake Ontario and you can see the one at the bottom. That's your heavily laden balloons anchored to the bottom with uh, concrete. And, and so it, it, it gets used in other parts. So Aruba is the second place where it's being done. But this is used even at some of the sea levels where if the sea falls off sharply, you can actually use it in the coast. So east part of the world, by the way, they don't have great beaches. And then the reason why they don't have great beaches is because it quickly falls off. And so people don't go there. You, like, you want a nice Florida type beach that you could walk into you know, for 300 feet, 400 feet. So it doesn't get used there because if you're too far out and shallow, your piping systems and others have got to go so far out that now you're adding more and more hydrostatic pressure losses, pumping losses, this, that, right? And so it doesn't get used. So that's the compressed air story for you. This is now emerging, okay? And it's a story I've got to share is ultra and super capacitors. In the past, we had capacitors, and it gets used everywhere. I mean, there is not a single place in our electronics we don't use capacitors. Our radio has got capacitors, our PCs have got. That's why when the light flickers, the PC doesn't go away. It's sort of just there, or your clock doesn't go away, it stays. <clears throat> and that's because ultracapacitors are very quick in charge and very quick in discharge. They are the fastest charge discharge mechanism you can find. So now the question is, what do we do with that? And some of the people, like in the United States, there are three in Boston, or two in Boston, one in Korea, who are saying, okay, you know what? If I have a nice, fast charge discharge requirement, and I have a long energy storage, a slow requirement. Can I put the two together to lower the cost? So a company called Alt, Occult or Alt, Alt in Australia has, is the first one. So what they have done is they have put ultra capacitors with lead acid batteries. Now, if you're not having a vehicle and you don't have other issues of space and weight and everything, uh, it's the cheapest battery you can find. But it is not the best performing battery you can find. Lead acid batteries are not the best performing. It, it, you can't hammer the lead acid battery like you do with a lithium ion battery. But if I do these two things pretty well, who knows, maybe there is an optimizing point and that becomes a choice in certain cases. So in a place in Bangalore, actually that's what we've done. In a remote community, it's ultra capacitors with lead acid batteries for a small community. Now, when I say small community, be careful. Our communities here are 300 to 150 kilowatts each. There in the, in the eastern part of the world, the community could be 50 kilowatts, okay? And so, so just be careful. That's the scale that we're talking about. Africa, it could be 10 kilowatts. So, so the question is, you know, do you have to cart all the latest technologies or do you have, can you do something in your roadmap that allows for some of these technologies? So supercapacitors are coming. Where will it next come? It'll replace your lead acid battery in your car because it's so lightweight, you don't have to worry about you know, only two starts. Typically, I don't know here how, how good battery you have, but there are two starts in winter and then the battery is dead. Because that's your lead acid battery. It can't go depth of discharge. It can't go to negative temperatures. It loses its entire capacity on temperature, right? And so that's the style of issue. So ultra capacitors come in at that point. Biomass, biogas is sort of the untold story of many countries. It is always felt that biomass is sort of yesterday's world. We're spending, you know, CO2. Yes, it's a CO2 emitter. But in a naturalized country like Costa Rica and other places, I go to Panama a lot, 
uh, there are these equations that balance off, you know, between the carbon sink and the carbon energy. So if you are careful enough with, it, with your environmental concerns, biomass has got a great play in certain parts of the world, not everywhere, uh, but in certain parts of the world. So I, I thought I'd throw that. Where is biogas? It's very distributed. I have a good friend, Peter Davis, in Australia. He has come up with, that picture is his, by the way, uh, you know, where you can actually take biomass, any form of bio waste, and you can generate heat, and you can generate power, much like a mobile diesel generator much like a mobile diesel generator. And I can tell you that that flare that comes off the exhaust is far, far cleaner. In fact, you won't even see the exhaust coming out. So it's not, again, you know, some new science fiction. These are all here to stay already. And those two pictures are of his. So the very last I want to end with, I think, is, is thermal energy. Parts of the world are saying, I need heat. I don't need electricity. We have continuously said, OK, you know what, we could take electricity and that become the delivery of every form, mechanical in motors, heater in the form of electric heat, and you can do anything else with it. Why? Because it's the most efficient transmission or delivery mechanism is the electric power. And that's 100 years, 200 years we have it. But many places does not have that infrastructure. Africa is a classic case of story, right? Despite 75% of Kenyans living near a transmission line, they still don't have power. Two-thirds of Africa does not even have a distribution line. So the question is, you know, what do they need? They need certain things to happen, and one of them is cooking. They use wood. That wood is not even, you know, made dry. They just go cut the wood and put it in the house. They have all these fumes, and they have health effect. It, first of all, doesn't burn clean. It doesn't give calorific value. And then it also causes health problems. So the question is, can we take heat, raise the temperature to cooking levels, which are about 250 degrees centigrade, say 400, 500 Fahrenheit, and can I cook with it? And so in India today, you have large kitchens feeding about 500 to 1,000 guys per day using the solar heat. Massive, massive congregations. You know, you, you, so I've taken pictures, actually three of them belong to India. And one is, con the bottom left is actually concentrated. The one like this looks like an antenna dish is a concentrated solar where actually you concentrate uh, the solar coming in onto the dish through reflectors, and then you generate at a very high temperature, 500, 600 degrees, and you store that. could be a simple mass of steel, and that's the storage, or it could be water, but water will never take you above 100. So then you say, what is my solvent that I need to take me above there, right? So various forms. The one that's in the long track is a Quebec company. Uh, it's, it's related to the Bombardier family, by the way, a young man. Uh, probably the third generation Bombardier uh, happened to meet him. And that's his company. And so you have various forms. Now, why did I throw these various forms is you need to know what you are doing. If you don't know what you're doing, you're going to wi wind up with the wrong thing. And so see the plethora of stuff, right? So you have that. The bottom, very bottom with that orangish thing is how do you take a wind plant and use it only for thermal heat storage? There are, that's a Siemens diagram, by the way. And what they're saying is wind over the long haul is cheap. The levelized cost of energy is so cheap and getting cheaper. Because today I can put one windmill of 2.5 megawatts on a single pole. 15 years ago, I could barely put 250 kilowatts. Right? So now I have constant. You, you see how you're getting concentrated power, much like you get with hydrocarbons? You're getting there. So 2.4 megawatts of single, and I don't know how many they will put, all you do is now you generate heat into a large pile of thermal, and that, that heat then goes for home district heating, whatever else, right? So it's very prevalent in the UK for, for uh, Europe on that. And, and the one to the right of that is the cryogenic type of model again, is to use wind power, renewable energy, and so on and so forth. So some examples of that. So some applications in architectures, and this is not to confuse you, for the power engineers, this is your delight. But for everybody else, this is the worst diagram you can see. Because it is complex, right? And this is what I grew up with for 30 years. So bless my soul. Uh, but you can see energy storage comes everywhere. It comes on the generation head. It comes on the transmission head, the high voltage 400 kV. It comes on the media voltage network. It comes with your renewable energy. It comes in your homes. It comes in your community. You can think of anything. I mean, there's a 
a, a kind of a joke. It's like bacon. It's very good with everything, right? It's so it's that kind of thing. So th th this was actually used as a speech in Germany. <coughs> they love their bacon, by the way. Uh, so, but I'm a vegetarian, just so I haven't had the taste. So it's, it's there everywhere, right? So now you need to figure out. You can't just say, you know what, Joe did this in Alabama, so I'm going to just bring it over here. Or Sally did it somewhere else, and I'm going to bring it over there. You got to think what you want. And what are so your specification, your requirements, your write-up is what's going to get you what you have asked for. And then you have to go around the point. So just remember how wide it is, right from that power tool in your house all the way to megawatt scale next to a generation plant or lookalike generation is energy storage. But it gives you one benefit, and that's to the left of the diagram, is all the inter intermittency that you can find with some of the newer renewable technologies, guess what? Now becomes a stable output as a result of the energy storage. So it, made, it looks like a coal generation. It looks like diesel generation. It looks like LNG generation. It looks like a nuclear plant. Not the size, of course. But the key is now I'm getting stable. What mankind needs is a stable power, and I'm now able to convert intermittent into stable power, which is what we have had for the last 100 years. So, so that's, I think, about the last slide that I have. Oh, no, I have one more, kind of renewable. So, so we have used it. There are three drawings. One is Next Tracker. Next Tracker is a solar company, in fact, in the US. And they actually put, along with the IPP, today IPPs, by the way, are moving with energy storage built in. So that you don't have to worry about you know, renewable energy IPP and then a storage IPP. You just go to these guys and say, you know what, you put it together, you tell me what the tariff is, and we do a reverse auction. By the way, there's no feed-in tariff anywhere. Uh, Ontario scrapped it now after, because it's very good for introduction of technologies. But once it's stable, you don't need all those incentives. So everywhere around the world is now reverse auction, where everybody auctions one lower below. It's like the tulip auction of Amsterdam, right? So that's what occurs. You go down, and then the bottom guy actually gets the contract. But there are two key elements. Markets doesn't care what, how rough your policy is, how rough the road is, or what potholes you have. What they look for is stability of the policy. You can't keep on saying today it's rough and yes, you know, tomorrow we'd like to patch up, yes. But then it upsets their bankability because they price it, they de-risk it, they de-risk the technology, they de-risk everything else, and they also have a bankability. So two things have got to happen, and this is the discussion I've been having with the powers be it here is you need to give them a 20-year contract at whatever price the auction is, not, not what they said, but what the auction price. And they're like, accept it. Today in Mexico, in two years of opening up the market, 600 megawatts of solar has gone in, two years. India has added 14,000 megawatts of solar in two and a half years. Their objective is to go to 75,000 megawatts of solar. And I'm doing the energy storage roadmap for the country. I mean, if you think this is challenging, guys, try to do 75,000 megawatts in a country that's probably yet smaller than Canada, but you still have the variance of that architecture drawing, or transmission, distribution, and everything, right? And, and that's where the world is headed. That's where the world is headed. The other two drawings are actually what we use in Ontario. Uh, one is for wind and, and the temporal power thing. But again, I'm trying to tell you, again, different architectures, different companies, different mixes, and you have to decide what you want. And otherwise, you, you're always going to be wrong. So, Thank you very much, and I hope it was informative. And any questions, happy to answer. If I can't answer, you know what? I learned from you. Somebody needs to operate the mic here. There's a lady here. last term that he used, IPP, is independent power producers. People that are solar wise here know that that's one of the things that we're trying to put in place here. The government has promised us that by the end of this year, we will have an independent power producers policy, which will allow people that want to put in solar or wind with batteries or whatever, to be able to make those proposals to the government and they'll know how much the power is going to sell for. So that's what an IPP is and that's pretty important. It's going to be an important part of our future here in the Yukon. But enough of the alphabet soup. Questions? There's, There's a, a lady here. Okay, go ahead. 
Thank you very much for all of your work. I'm really happy that you can bring the international component because I feel like, um, especially in Canada, uh, we have such a diversity in the situations that we're looking at. So, um, you know, like even in the Yukon, most of our population lives in Whitehorse, and then we have these small rural communities. And I think it's really important to look at how y what you can do on a smaller scale you know, and uh, especially when you're in small communities that can all work together, then you can work also to um, change your energy consumption to match the type of power source that you have, you know, so that hopefully you can charge the batteries or however you're going to store the energy in the right way. My question is, um, how have you looked at some of the communities in the Yukon at what our usage is and um, could you broadly give us some ideas of where we could kind of focus our research to look at how those would work in, in smaller communities? Yes. So 15 years ago, I think this question came up in the pan-Canadian utility space. You actually have, you know, a lot of communities up north, and you have microgrids. I'm, I'm actually the international convener for microgrids with 18 countries, and Canada is a member of that. And I'm Michael Ross, for those of you who know, is, is that member. So this issue is, what is the architecture of microgrid that doesn't have a support from the grid? But let me tell you, all of Yukon is a microgrid. You're not connected to the national grid. Where do you think is the biggest microgrid in North America? Hawaii. Sorry? Hawaii. Hawaii is one. Okay, something even bigger than that. Texas. The ERCOT system of Texas is actually a microgrid. It does not connect to the rest of the United States. You know how much of wind they have? The wind power of Texas will make us feel ashamed. Right? And you know who they borrowed it from? They gave us an award in 2008. I was feeling so bad that in 2008, a Texan will give an award to a Canadian. How, how far does that occur, right? But they did. They followed Ontario. So I'm not saying we should follow people blindly, but you follow the best practices, and then you make the market very localized as you will, right? So the key question in all that is microgrid exists everywhere. The Indonesia has 64,000 islands, oh sorry, 6,400 islands within the country called Indonesia. We don't think about it that way. So in the microgrid community as we have, Chris Marnay runs a grid-connected uh, microgrid from Lawrence Berkeley Lab, and I'm the other guy on the off-grid. So I've got a difficult task, but there is no boat anchor to sustain the grid. So to your question, madam, what we see is the architecture of what's connect, grid connected and this reliability that you have has to be made more sophisticated in a microgrid. Because the fluctuations, what a grid can take, it's like a rock solid anchor, does not exist in fact in a microgrid because every unit that you connect to the diesels, the flywheels, the energy storage, even a load, step load, people turn loads on, is a constant shock that's happening, right? So instead of a ship, the Queen Mary, it's actually a, a, either a canoe or it is something else. So a microgrid to me, when it was first somebody said, actually it was, uh, I don't know who asked, but they asked me, can you give me a physical example? I said, in a harbor you can have a couple of ships and the ship right, nicely rocks. It's heavy, nothing moves it. Or you can have like a San Diego harbor with everybody, you know, on, uh, on, on these uh, boards. And everybody is bobbing up and down, but yet at the same time, you know, they're forming a grid by holding each other or whatever they do. So that's the volatility of a microgrid. So some of these technologies, if done right, can actually displace fossil fuel. So the flywheel, I think the flywheel is an important part. Uh, batteries could be an important part. And, and so we have studied some of these architectures. JP sitting there does a wonderful job for us in the remote community. And, and he is the hands-on guy when he is there, right? So, but we need to say, okay, what is the best that we have for the load characteristics that you if you've got largely heating loads, it's one type. If you've got motorized loads, it's something else. In, in Africa, actually, it's people say, I don't want you know, some of these entertainment electronics. I want to be able to do the rice huller, uh, the coconut grater. And that's a motorized load running off a solar panel. So we have a solar panel now without a battery that can actually give you machine tools, circular saws, uh, certain types of saws. Actually, all I did was put a bigger capacitor in the, in the solar panel. Because you don't use it continuously, you just do a two by six cut for what, 15 seconds? Uh, and by the time you say you put it down and go for the second cut, the capacitor is charged. So why do I need an expensive battery? 
I need an expensive battery when I want a long-term problem. So by using such ingenuity techniques, you can actually solve a lot of the world's problems as long as you think like them. So in your environment as you live, in the cold climates, the fossil fuel, everything, you've got to actually think. So with ATCO today, we had a great discussion. Dave has to come to this. He's already doing two things that JP's involved. One is a solar one, and one is a wind one, right? And it's already happening. And both of them are IPP, sort of, because ATCO do licensing cannot actually get into certain things. So the battery is actually like an IPP connection. <coughs> the wind is an IPP, the solar is. So that model is already occurring, right? And so the question is, how do you do things even better to get more fossil out? And I think it's, there's a potential. Yes, sir. Thanks for a great talk. Um, you never mentioned hydrogen at all in your talk. Yes. Is there a reason? Yes. I didn't mention hydrogen at all for one reason only. Canada, by the way, leads in hydrogen. Okay, Ballard Power was there. This is Charles Ballard started it. A lot of federal dollars went to it. Hydrogenics is another one in Mississauga that does it. In my career, I, I, we actually evaluated hydrogen for as a storage for purposes of remote control. But I think the problem that we had was we s had the wrong problem that we initiated. What we said was, we are going to put wind, the wind will actually displace the load and the excess will go into charge of hydrogen, right? And that charging of hydrogen actually came out in the results. In fact, this was in Kenora area somewhere. That said, for almost four months of excess, the dribble charging, I only got like a week's worth of hydrogen. So, you know, the wrong problem, wrong setting, the second problem we had back then was the acidic uh, electrolyzers. Uh, in the old days, all you did was you put salt in water and then you got hydrogen out, right? Now you've gone to alkaline, and alkaline is six times better. So that improvement has been made. Ha can it be made even better? I do not know. Now, on the hydrogen seam, there's a second theory that's going on, and that is the high temperature. So instead of getting electrolyzed hydrogen from water, they can actually reform uh, methane, they can reform hydrocarbons at a higher temperature. So the Bloom Energy guys, the University of Queens guys in Ontario, they all came up with what is called the solid oxide fuel cells. So you have the PEM fuel cells, the Ballard and the hydrogenics, and you got the solid oxide guys. Again, it's a temperature issue, you know, something like 600, 700 degrees. It's got, it operates much like a combined heat and power. You have to have certain minimum loads. You can't go up and down. The PEM fuel cell can go up and down, right? It can do that. We also looked at the Bellacoola project, which was also a failure. Let's learn from our failures. Hydrogen being such a small molecule, you can't use your normal containers to store hydrogen. It gets between the steel and escapes. It's a very light atom, okay? So you have to have certain precaution. Now it's, it's being done, so don't get me wrong. I'm just giving you examples of where we failed with BC Hydro's Bellacola project funded by the federal and we shut it down. I, I w I've been on several, several of these committees, so I know some of the inside stories. <coughs> That's number one. The second is the calorific value of hydrogen is one-sixth of that of fossil fuel. So you have diesel, gasoline, then you have L LNG, which is still relatively net CO2 less exporter, and then you have hydrogen, which is one-sixth. So I need six times hydrogen to do the same thing that I could do with a liter of fuel. So that when you now look to say, how do I carry that fuel with me? Where do I manufacture it? We looked at trains in Ontario, by the way. I was on the steering committee or, a, or the scientific committee. Can we do, you know, the go, go train, as we call it back there? Can we run it on hydrogen? Yes, theoretically, you can. But the question is, where do you pick it up? And we said, you know, it's got to be produced at the Pickering nuclear plant because that's where you get cheap power at night. And you put this big, big, big hydrogen stations if you can. So think. And then you transport it all to, you know, Mimico in downtown Toronto, which is the marshalling yard. And then it has to go to so many other trains, and then it has to be stored. How do you store it? Do you compress it? Do you liquefy it? What do you do, right? So when you look end to end, it doesn't sort of quickly come into one of these bailiwicks that I'm talking about. It's, it's still very customized. It has got high pieces of engineering. It's got certain solutions still to be done. But in science, yes, it is, it's, it's probably one of the future. So there are many people, including me, and I believe this, Battery is only an, in, you know, it's just a, a stopgap for the next 25 years. Your ultimate is that. Now, it's hoped that that hydrogen atom at that time will come from another form of a fusion as opposed to the electrolysis and steam reformations and everything, right? So who knows? Somebody will find a good way to split that hydrogen atom 
uh, very cheaply, and then it's a hydrogen world for you. So that's why. Well, uh, thanks. Uh, thanks for excellent presentation. Very succinct. Um, just have a brief question on policy. I'm glad you arrived at it at the end. As a freelance journalist, I'm writing about it for the last 10 years, and I noticed that all these jurisdictions that made great broad progress from Germany to Denmark to Scotland to Nicaragua, it was all done with renewable frameworks, contracts, renewable energy source legislation, not carbon pricing. Right. And when I, when I, when I bring this, uh, pr so I brought this up here with environmental NGOs, with the NDP, with liberals, and all every time it comes back, no, 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 we don't want contracts, we long contracts. I mean, Fossil has 200 contracts. We don't want even 20 years for renewables, right? We want carbon pricing, cheaper, easier. I mean, fraud is always cheaper than honest work. Uh, so it's a you know, legally owned framework by the fossil industry and the financial speculators siphon off the investment from renewables. If renewable is old-fashioned manufacturing, right? So, this is so, so we are a bit stuck. We could have made progress here years ago on policy, but people are um, um, infatuated with carbon pricing ab abstractions, oil and gas industry talking points, and we're stuck a little bit that way here. So let me answer in two parts. People learn, time moves on, society becomes better. Nothing has been stable for the last 100 years, and going forward, nothing will be stable. Back then, carbon taxes became a big issue because A, it was a tax. You already get enough of taxes, and now you're adding one more tax. Second, they could not verify what it was, and therefore there was a mistrust on who will verify that you are and he is, or you are not and he is, right? And that became a big issue. So policy pushed in terms of actually enabling renewable energy, which was a cheaper way to get it into society. Today, fast forward 35 years, since Germany began in the late seven, early 70s. No, 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 1999 was the third version in Germany, in fact, right? So, yeah, the very, very first one, Germans and the Danish guys were the first ones to get into that. So today, you may say, you know what, is, there, is it the right time for carbon tax? Even that, if you read the National Post, the Globe, and everybody else, there's an impasse at the federal level. Why? Because again, people have not understood it. Parts of Canada have not understood it. Some other parts, like BC has understood it, has got a carbon tax for seven years. Other parts have not announced it, but the Prime Minister has made an announcement in COP21 in Paris, and so now we are sort of stuck for want of an acceptance. Agree. Hear me, hear me out. Correct. Hear me out. Let me tell you one thing. The fossil industry, the gasoline industry, the car industry has all been subsidized at one time in its history. This business that I'm a free world and I'm a free market and everything should be free, and now judge me on that, is actually a myth. You must actually say by policy to what periods of time uh, you, know, you will need this and at what period will the government back off and have simple things like carbon taxes or any form of levy and the market takes over. Today you will not believe, and I was really, I was telling students, uh, a driver of, and I won't mention the company because you'll probably recognize, he suddenly said, aren't you the guy who talked today at uh, 7 o'clock at CBC? I said, how did you know that? He said, I just took a guess. Probably I look different, I know I'm wearing a tie, you know, the, the offbeat guy, who wears a tie and you can I guess. But anyway, the, the key is, you know, he, uh, he, but you know what he said? And, and I, w I would purposely hide some of the comments because it'll give him away. He said, you know, I'm heavily into the fossil industry, but I have one faith. I'm innovative, and I'll always have another job somewhere else, right? That is, I think, what I found in a lot of youngsters here. That's the fun. When I go to your websites, I talk, people talk about saving you know, the planet. And, not, and you've got resources 99.2% you know, already. Quebecers are like that. BC is like that, right? Yes, in Ontario, you've got nuclear. So it's a little funny money there. But the key aspect of it is, Canada is green, 68% in despite Alberta being 90%, Nova Scotia being 90% fossil, parts of Saskatchewan being 90% fossil. We are 70, so 69% green across Canada, right? You've got that. You've got so the question is, that spirit of greenness is there probably somewhere in our culture. Somewhere in our upbringing it's there. Maybe because we see 
the potential for renewables, the potential for the environment is there, right? It's not there in some parts of the world, let me tell you. You go south of the border, in many, many parts, it's not just there. Look at California. Despite the big market that it has, it still has to be led by policy. It has not come. Even today, energy storage is sitting with the CPUC, and you know, you've got that, right? So let's not blame ourselves that somehow we're too socialistic and trying to do things, and the capitalistic way of putting a simple tax will solve. Yes, it will. A simplest way is like the road tax, the tire tax, school tax, property tax, you can add everything else, that's the simplest form. The market then knows where to go. But the key aspect of it, every time you try to bring something as simplistic as that, it doesn't work within the policy realm it, because the social aspects of people accepting it takes a few years or maybe even a decade. So the answer is I think carbon tax will come. It's the simplest form of signal, the market pricing signal. But like all of the industry, including the gasoline industry and everything else, it took decades for it to be so simplified. Today, the price of gasoline that you have is 50% tax in Canada. It's not, it's almost 49% tax. So, but we've accepted it, right? So just bear out, over the next 10 years, we'll have this discussion again, if I'm still around. And uh, you know, we will, we'll, uh, by then, maybe there is a carbon tax. There will be, because it is the simplest signal you can send. Pricing mechanism is the simplest one to send to people, to masses, to adjust their consumption. Some will still consume, and they'll pay a heavy tax. Others will not, just like the GST. People hated the GST. But it is the best tax you can have because it's a consumption-oriented tax. How many countries around the world actually copy Canada to go into the value-added tax system around the world in, in, in emerging markets? In fact, a partner of EY was stationed in India for 10 years to get the GST done. And it took him 10 years to get GST done in India, right? And, and he had to be taken from EY uh, there, because he was the one who introduced it here for 20 years. So it's coming. It's too simplistic, in my view, sometimes, for people to understand the graph. It takes a few time, uh, years. But let's not understand that every industry, from steel to car to everything, has at one time been subsidized. But the trick of the good government is when to back off. You introduce it, like a feed-in tariff, you come off at 10 years and say, okay, now the market's stable, let's go IPP, let's go reverse option, let the market. Many countries do not know when to back off, and that's when it gets into sort of very heavily government contested, heavily government control, and then the other issues come up. Is the government the right agency to run a business? Right, and I agree, and I agree that's the issue. Yes, sir. Southern U.S. has thousands and thousands of solar panels yes. and hundreds and hundreds of turbines on ridges. And along with that, they have 55 cent a liter U.S. gasoline. Yes. Can you explain how they've made the jump to put in w uh, wind and solar in spite of cheap gasoline without penalty? Good. What, what's incentivizing the use of solar and wind and how can we incentivize it here in the Yukon? How can we take the carbon tax and incentivize getting off fossil fuels? Good, you know, it's a great question. Here are the people with the lowest subsidy, in fact, if you will, on the, on the carbon fuels uh, have adopted this, the Texans, right? Big time. The closer you get to Texas, the cheaper it The cheaper it gets. You know what's the one answer? Is understanding the levelized cost of energy. We are so fixated on the capex that we lose track of the actual energy that's almost free. Today, in the, in the, in if you do what's called the stacking, all independent uh, system operators around the world, they stack based on economic outputs when you uh, bid. So there's a hydroelectric plant, there's a nuclear plant, there's all that. They all bid in in the 24-hour auction, and then the 415-minute auction, and then the five-minute auctions, right? They change. You will see that the wind, many times, is almost free. In Ontario, for example, right outside the Bruce nuclear plant is 700 megawatts of wind. The policy question came, you know, do we back off nuclear, which is trying to turn the Queen Mary every day, or do you actually back off wind and spill it? But you know what we did? We did, I think, smart, which is a second lesson to be learned. We introduced the take or pay, because that poor guy whom you don't take his power and pay, he's not bankable anymore the next day. He goes bankrupt. So. The best from a societal perspective is you make that contract whole. Now you say, what do I do with the excess power on the days that I have excess power from wind and solar? And so Remia, uh, Nalco in uh, Nova Scotia, New Brunswick, what do they do? 
they take the excess power and they actually push it into your hot water tanks. You have a dual, you know, the dual element. One element is your hot water tank. The second one, they take control through telemetry. And every time the market sends them a 15 minute, one hour signal for excess power, the second element raises your hot water tank by two degrees. So you just heat the water a little more by two degrees, right? So it, there is a way to rationalize all this, right? But the question is, if you keep on saying CapEx, 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 you'll never get hydroelectric power. Hydroelectric power is the most expensive on CapEx, the cheapest on OpEx. So the rationalization of what's called the levelized cost of energy, to some extent, is done in the IPP reverse auction market. You're not telling them how much it'll cost to build. You're saying, if you were to build it, what's going to be the cost of power for 20 years, and I'll give you a cost price. And that happens to be four cents, six cents, five cents, whatever they de-risk it. The more difficult you make it for them, the higher the price. So that's what drove the, the, the American mind or the capitalistic mind, okay? It'll never go socialistic or anything. But if the capitalists can go the way they have gone, we, the, the so-called European model of social, socialism, why have you not adopted it? It's policy. You need that conversion. You need people to say, I believe in it. You will form, you'll storm, you'll form, you'll storm. But in the end, there's a general pattern. And then that gets enabled even better because we all said yes. The various you know, chambers of commerce, the various other bodies have to come back and say, you know what? Probably you should do it. And yes, you know, you may be a little wrong. You will never go right there. You'll probably go a little off track here and there. But your general trend towards the path is what Germany did, is what Spain did, is what all the other countries are doing it right now that's not renewables, big time, including Mexico, our closest example. Chile did it years ago. And they have actually said, you know what, that's just because it makes economical sense as well. Not in CapEx terms, but in levelized cost of energy. Yes. No tough questions, Sally. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for this. This is fantastic. And um, what I, um, uh, one of the things that you mentioned yesterday when I was listening to you, you were talking about um, your input and uh, into, t and technical input into the utilities regulators, you know? And uh, we have a, u a regulator here, the Yukon Utilities Board that regulates our utilities. And um, you said something yesterday that really uh, struck me, and, and uh, since we are all um, customers of a regulated utilities, that I, I wanted you to share with this audience what um, you told me. And you said that, that there's a way that our politicians, our legislature, can actually direct the utilities board to consider environmental green energy and all the politicians have to do is slap a order in council to say and you direct the regulator that they must consider the green energy right. in their deliberations when the utility goes to the board to bring a project forward and that must be considered and that is a policy direction instead of you said that the utilities board is normally like a financial tool, all of those right. things, it's got to be good for the rate base and all those sort of things, but it's a policy decision to say, we're going to go green, right. we're going to go low carbon, we want this to happen, and it can happen at the regulator's level. Right. So, right. so what I was telling yesterday, and I'll reconfess all the patients I think, is Everybody is true to the statute. The, the, the regulator is a court of law, it's a tribunal. In fact, it's not even a court of law. By statute, it's a tribunal. In other words, the law of precedence doesn't actually hold in a regulator's jurisdiction, okay? So it's even higher in speculative terms, if you will, with the consistency of hearings and, and the deliverance you can get. So they are saying, you know, I go by the book that I've got. It's just like a judge in the Supreme Court says, I go by the laws of this country. I don't make up the laws for you. The only place where laws are given a little bit of latitude is the tort law. Did you do the best? You know, so in environmental judgments, it always comes up. Did you do the best? What were audit systems did you have? Or did you, were you negligent, right? Otherwise, it's, it's black and white. Whatever the legislators do is what the judge interprets. 
So the, the utilities board is no different. I mean, the, around the world, it's no different. They're given a book that says, you know, rate payer, rate payer, rate payer, and the rate payer should not be risked. And therefore, you know what? Every time there's a security risk project, throw it up, right? Let somebody else do it. The second rule that they hold is the benefits of a system-wide benefit cannot accrue to one of the applicants. So if you are a transmission line, I, I had this all the time. As a wires company, when Ontario Hydro went wires and generation and all got broken out, uh, the benefit of an end customer to a certain thing that I put into my system, I could not go to the regulator and draw that benefit and say, I spent this money, but you know what, 25% belongs to beyond the meter, 75% belongs to me, so you know, let's do that adjustment. No, no, it's, it's, the benefit has to come 100% to what I did. Then the regulator passes it or it doesn't pass it. So all the jurisdiction, including Ontario, that have led this, have said, you know, how do I break the log jam? Because the utilities then are held to their regulation, that they, their access, they, they can't do certain things. Like, I, you know, most utilities cannot go beyond the meter into your house. You must have certain affiliates that say looks like a contractor and the contractor can go. But for example, most regulated utilities cannot do certain things. They can only do what's regulated, given in the regulation. So the question is, how do you beat that, right? So Germany was the first one to start, Denmark was the other one, Spain was the third one when they brought in. They said, the only way to let the regulator know is to actually say what the new law is going to look like. So now there are two books, the regular book, and there is a saying that, you know what, it's like the duty to consult. I don't know, for those of you who are aware of the new First Nations, the duty to consult is actually like a law. You know, if you, you can actually be held accountable if the duty to consult is not performed today across the country. So it was just a, a, a kind of a formulation of policy directive, the duty to consult has become like a law. So in a way, the policy directive of the minister, because he or she holds all these entities, is to say, you know what, thou shalt look at green projects as an alternative when proposals will come, which also tells the utility that, you know, you can't just keep on doing what you did yesterday. You have to come up with new green alternatives and say why you should. So let me give you a little bit of issues that I may have faced. 900 million is the actual spend of the Hydro One. So 17 binders. Every two years, we had to go to the court with 17 binders. The 18th binder is my D-ring binder, okay? Of a little bit, $13 million of spend, nothing. But the president would sit right next to me and say, you know, don't you screw me up on the 900 million because then you're, you know, you're gonna get me fired and I'll fire you with me. So, yeah, and, and so that was the thing, because the regulator's thing is to, I, I want to get a judgment in my favor. And 900 million trumps 13 million, right? So will you believe that on the 13 binders, the 14 binders, the never, generally the questions were very, not very good intervening. I mean, it probably was done years after years after years, so everybody knew the answer. But I got 66 plus questions on the smart grid, renewable energy changes that I was trying to do. So the question was, how do I go? So the question was, how do you know what's the probability of success? Sir, 50%. Oh no, 50% ain't good enough. You know, we need 99%, blah, 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 okay. So I said, how do you break this log jam and, and get it passed because it's a court of law? So what we did was, actually, I had town hall meetings across Ontario. I would do almost like three or four or maybe three a month. And I would say, you know, I'm going to the lion's den. I would get eaten up. but. Across the province, I did like 50, 60, right? And my, my staff would come with me as well. And to just hear what people had to say, some for, some against, something, oh, why you, you know, that kind of thing. Or the dairy farmers would say, you know, no, no, I need this or whatever. But it allowed me to do two things. It allowed me to say what I'm saying, much like today. And if you probably 10 times you hear me, some of you may say, you know, I believe this guy. Others may say, I don't believe this guy, right? That's fine. So it allowed me to do that. And the second it allowed me to say was why the renewable energy integration was not yesterday's problem, it's a future problem. All the tools that we had at the time, the fact that you could not do it, uh, you know, put 100% of renewable energy was because of certain technical challenges. The third thing what we did was we made it transparent. So people would apply to connect, and that was a feed in tariff. Remember, the government said, thou shalt. If you can't connect, you know, you got a problem, tell me why, right? So we made it transparent to say, you know what, this feeder, all these guys have applied and we give them code ID numbers. And people could see that there was a big lineup on Sydney TS, but there's nobody there at Lennox TS. 
And that also allowed for now the movement of the so-called same number of megawatt connections to be sort of ubiquitous around which helped us uh, do it. So you have to do a multitude of techniques to say, you know, even with that to say, this is how I did it. What are the other economic stuff I stunt I tried is, I always had seven things with everything. Seven guys with the same idea, three or four utilities that put up money as equity, you know. And also we'd have, you know, the best of the world in academia and others to come with us across the country, DC Hydro. And, and, and therefore we would stand and say, if seven people can think like this and four people can put money in a, in a, in a multi-million dollar project, you know, there's gotta be something that everyone thinks there's a likelihood of success even though the individual probability is 50%. So over time, we, these transparency allowed, even with all the policy directors, it allowed them to say, you know what, there's a methodology to the madness, these guys are working hard, they've done the things, look at the track. And what we said was, every two years we were called up because we were a large utility. I don't know how many years they called up. And we would say, two years I'm doing this, and by the way, this is my four year window. And at the next year, we would give them again a two-year update and a two-year, so it was a moving scale. They could see the roadmap that we built. But if you don't have that roadmap, you got a big problem because you're saying, I'm doing this experiment, then I'm doing that experiment. They'll say, why did you fund this guy? Oh, I don't know, look nice. And then you say, oh, why did you fund that? Oh, you know, that guy looked even better than the third, second guy. So <laughs> it, it becomes a policy mismatch, right? So even with policy, there is a set of steps so when I may say that it has to be led with policy, it's got to also be led with support by you all. You, I'm quite sure, belong to the fraternity that you all belong. Write letters of support that you think is useful. Write letters of support that you think is not useful if you want to critique something. But that enables, and I see MLAs here, distinguished MLAs, allows them to say, you know what, I think the society in general in Yukon is one to And how is generally you know, policy made? It, it is made through the collective wisdom, right? And so it allows us to then say, why not have a pathway? So the question I was also raising yesterday was, what is Yukon's pathway? What is a roadmap for Yukon? How does ACTCO partake in it? How does Yukon Energy partake in it? Who holds the 20-year contract? Is it the Yukon Development Corporation? You need sovereign debt guarantee. So who holds the contract, 20-year contract? And who holds the take or pay? Somebody has to have a take or pay for these IPPs. So, so you see how parts of your mechanism is still not solved. So the policy would have to sort of address these areas and say, you know what, that person now is will hold this PPA holding. Uh, we now give a take or pay for this. We'll do reverse auction. And by the way, all these utilities, by the way, should be allowed to propose green. And that will be an alternative to yesterday's thinking. That's where we went. So today, after eight years, maybe nine years, I've retired four years ago, so I don't know what I've done. We don't need that 13th binder. It's now deemed as though everything we will do is smart. Everything we will do will not be yesterday. We have to look forward. So nobody's going to replace something that's 40 years uh, longevity with something that was built 40 years ago. Why do it? I mean, that way you're going to have the same thing for the next 40 years. So it's now become a part. So now, is this the only story of Ontario? No. Quebec has gone through that same thing. BC has gone through the same thing. And, and so it's a process. But it all begins with your question, the policy director. Because otherwise, we cannot move. We are shackled by the very instruments that control us. So I'm looking at the Ravi, we want to thank you very much for agreeing to escape the ice storm. Yes. To come to tropical Yukon. There's still ice falling off the CN Tower yeah. in downtown Toronto, so it's going to be cold when I get back. And I think the conversations that we've had over the last couple of days are going to yield a rich harvest over the next year, particularly as the IPP comes into place. So I want to thank you, thank you. on behalf of all of us for your ideas, and I'm sure that you've sown a lot of seeds this evening. And I also would like to thank the community for all the meetings I had. You kept me very busy with various <laughs> stakeholders. And I learned as well the, the, the uniqueness of why certain things don't work. We make assumptions down south as to how the north would be. But let me leave you with one thought. And I think the Yukon Chamber of Commerce, I think, has a logo. Well, we are for Yukon, and Yukon is our business, or something like that, right? And so you have to think 
what is the solution by you, of you, for you. And then everything else comes. We can come as advisors, we can come and help us, but I don't think anybody else should think about what you corners want. It should be you folks. 